everyone, and welcome back to my freak show. As y'all know, I live for theories. And once I saw Rabbit Rabbit last week on American Horror Stories, I knew I found my first theory of the season. How did Rabbit Rabbit get approved by Netflix? Why didn't someone at Netflix go crazy after watching the movie? So let's flip on Netflix, put on some Rabbit Rabbit, and rip this theory apart. Please remember this is just a theory and Rabbit Rabbit is not a real movie. Special shout out to my longtime patron Chase Dyer. You're the best Chase. And this video is brought to you by me. Buy my books on Amazon. There's plenty you know. They're even free on Unlimited. Now first things first, I want to say to those of you out there who actually have your movie on Netflix, Amazon, or another platform, congratulations. You are a massive badass. And if my explanation is wrong, well, I researched the best I could with my time, so don't be a dick in the comments. So let's go through the process of getting a movie on Netflix. Let's say I made a hypothetical movie, Regina, in 1986, and I want it on Netflix. First, I must know the film genre that I want to place Regina in, and of course the audience that I made the movie for. Knowing my audience is literally make or break for my film. Regardless if the film is completed or not, I must find a distributor unless I intend to market Regina myself. So for the sake of this theory, I need a distributor. I believe in my movie and I know people will love it. So I must give a hearty pitch to someone at a company that distributes the genre that best fits my movie. I'll show them maybe a movie trailer, the artwork, plans for a franchise, the whole shebang. Basically, they get everything except the actual movie. If they love my pitch and my accessories and believe in the movie as much as I do, they'll sign me to their company and I will be paid based on the contract, which of course, this explains the roles. But why Larry chose a nice car instead of investing it in like a home or something else is just, you know, way beyond me. So how do I get Regina on Netflix? As usual, I have to have a meeting with someone at Netflix who makes those decisions. At the meeting, I give the person the pitch of my life. If she or he likes my pitch, she or he will negotiate the licensing fee and terms with my distribution company, not me. For a first timer like myself, Netflix will buy a standard one year to two year licensing fee, which gives them permission to show Regina on their platform and receive a percentage of the profits. If people add Regina to their queue, they watch it, like it, even review it, Netflix will add more years to the licensing timeframe. Once again, it is unlikely anyone at the actual company will watch the movies approved by the company unless it's, you know, personal. There are thousands of movies pitched to the company to their various different departments. So it's logical that they don't actually watch any of the movies. They base their judgment and if the show actually gets on Netflix based on the judgment on the pitch alone. Now, for example, cuties. I mean, you know, that's still on their site and I honestly haven't watched it, but that sparked a huge controversy. Um, other countries have also banned certain movies that Netflix have put up, such as The Bridge, Full Metal Jacket, Cooking While High, Disjointed. I mean, there basically does indicate that Netflix is not a flawless company. Larry is the filmmaker and we know Twisted Flicker Studios, a reverse mind pictures helped distribute the film. The poster indicates music by Ed Sanchez and is produced by Manny Cotto. Regardless, Larry is responsible for pitching Netflix and he gave Chad and Kelly this passionate speech about films and how he truly wanted to create something different. So I can only imagine the speech that he gave to the executives. They bought the license and allowed the audience to decide if it was a good investment or not. When Larry pitched his movie, I'm sure the premise highly enticed the greedy executives at Netflix. They love taboo shit. I mean, you know, Faces of Death, Cannibal Holocaust, Evil Dead, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. They were considered extremely violent and most of them were banned in the 80s when they were created. 
Oh God, I have to say really quickly, guys, the 80s was such a great time to be a patron at the cinema for horror movies. I'm very glad that that was actually in my generation. So in my opinion, just the mere pitch of a movie with a so-called curse to those who would watch it would have been interesting to the executives. And then they, of course, bought the license and at that point would have allowed the audience to decide if it was a good investment or not. That's their formula. <laughs> of course, letting the audience decide. Hmm, that's hilarious. Now, sure, this premise has absolutely been used before of Rabbit Rabbit. I do know this, guys. Now, however, it is a formula that hasn't been overused like the zombie trope has. So I think that's why I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I normally would, say, if it were a zombie virus. Now, based on the history of horror movies and the demand for young girls and or couples to be hacked to death by an escape maniac, I'd say Rabbit Rabbit had a good chance of being picked up without being viewed by one single studio executive. After all my research, I can tell you with confidence, viewing the movie is not essential to its success until it's watched by an actual audience. So I've basically explained how Larry got his movie on such a broad platform, and I answered how Rabbit Rabbit would have not been viewed by anyone at the company, so they would not have turned into these crazy kill you know, killers. But one thing I do find funny, at this point in the story, only the distribution company has actually paid Larry. We know he wasn't in it for the money, you know, he was in it for the art. He knew something bad would happen when the movie aired on such a large platform. Larry even watched the news, so he knew something huge would happen when the movie was released on Netflix. And the only thing he did to prepare for this new apocalypse, so to speak, is buy a car and live in the middle of nowhere. My God, if Chad and Kelly didn't come along to burn him alive, then he probably would have been killed anyway by the monsters that he created. Ultimately, if we follow the formula of the story, the movie will turn everyone who watches it into a mindless kill crazy dude or dudette. And since Mallory ended Michael and his apocalypse, Perhaps this is another version of the apocalypse in this new alternate timeline of American Horror Story. Mm, yes, Smithers. Oh, shit, now I'm gonna have to find out like the year that this episode took place just to see if it's true. Lord, I'm all theories all the time. Now that wraps it up for this theory video. Long story short, Netflix caused the apocalypse and killed everyone just because they couldn't take the time to watch a freaking movie. Now a new theory video is coming to you soon, so like and subscribe if you want. Till then, thanks for watching and beware of our girl's sexy scathage. Beware of sexy scathage.